we can't wait to showcase today this. Um, I'm going to read it out from the top of your screen, Paul, CDMS system, and more on that in a moment. But first of all, just want to say a very warm welcome and a huge thank you to you, Paul, for agreeing to spend time with us and sharing this solution with us. Um, yeah, first of all, big thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for uh, <laughs> allowing me to share my work. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. We love doing these showcases. Um, they let us kind of explore what the community is doing with all of these tools that Connor and I um, play around with all the time. But as you can see on screen, um, we've got Connor as well. So give us a wave, Connor. Hello. And throughout, what we'll do is we'll ask you questions, Paul. Um, the very first question is, um, I mean, what are we talking about today? What is this thing called CDMS? So acronym, of course, it is the Control Document Management System. Um, it all came from a client want and need, uh, in a sense. Uh, I do come from a managed service provider, which is, you know, support for various clientele uh, when it comes to IT. And we do support the, uh, the kind of delivering of solutions, automation, and all that fun stuff. So this is a request from just a, a client. Um, in, a lot of clients come from this area needing something to manage their policies, standards, forms, templates, guides, you know, it goes on forever. Um, but they wanted a way to perform um, a seamless transition from editing, inputting the metadata inside the file, and then publishing it through a, an approval system. And then it come out on the other end in a published space where people can read uh, those uh, kind of like finalized documents in a sense. So if we take a look at this, these are all the final documents converted to a PDF format um, with all the metadata that they wanted to show uh, in a in a formatted way of admin, you know, departmentalized, and then in the type of format, uh, the documents coming in like audit form, template, and stuff like that. So what you see here is all coming from a client's list of requests so to speak and i just kind of like guided it in a way to be like more uh, user friendly in a sense and and work the way they wanted to so to speak so hopefully that comes across uh in a way that's understandable but um yeah and this yeah is what absolutely it's, the end product yeah so, I mean, yeah, that's really interesting. So this is a response to client requests. I'm sure you get many of them. Um, you work for a, a managed service provider, is that right? So you provide these kind of services. Is is this CDMS thing then something you've um, you've heard about a lot over the years? You build these kinds of things regularly for clients. Um, I mean, I guess what I'm searching for is this is this something quite common? The want for a system like this very common. Uh, the there, there is an endless supply of control document management systems, but I've never seen one that is just 100% integrated into SharePoint in a, in a way that is just, you know, one click, solve all the metadata problems, and then send off for approval. And it all is maintained within the micro ecosystem. Um, a lot of ones would come on and then plant their system on top of SharePoint, and SharePoint is like the back end to their front end where I wanted just to have, and they wanted it as well, just to be all integrated into SharePoint because people are familiar with SharePoint, the day in day out work that they have. So, um, you know, clicking on a property, it's all inbuilt into the one view and they're not jumping around, trying to chase their tail a little bit. So um, yeah, this is the end product of um, what kind of all in one solution, so to speak. <laughs> With Microsoft. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so familiarity and client requirements on that fairly common use case of managing documents and policies and procedures and the process of getting the updates done and flowing. Is there like is there an example you could just demonstrate for us early on so people can cement what that might look like? Yeah, so uh, you know, you can drag and drop a file, you can upload it through the normal SharePoint upload feature, you can do a copy. Uh, copy is not advised because you copy the metadata. So we usually have like a, a guideline that has no metadata set. And then as soon as it's created, uh, it will come up with like a requirement not met. So they can't do anything with this. They can't submit it. But once they hit properties, they're clearly showing everybody's familiar with the requirement fields showing up as red. Um, you know, and it I, we don't have to really educate the user with this type of format because it's like 
you know what to do by simply just looking at it. Uh, I wouldn't even need to explain it to the audience, but you know, you're just choosing the department, choosing the type of it. Now you're just chucking in the document owner. owner. Mike Smith, I like to use very generic names. And then the tagging system. So this is a way of them sorting uh, various documents in um, the published space. So if they're wanting to onboard a user, they can then send them a link to the published space and all the documents are tagged as onboarding. And then they can just send them to a view that is filtering the onboarding tag. So it's very, uh, it's a nice way to consolidate data by metadata and not by a folder structure because we all know clicking, 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 people get lost when you're just really delivering one click and away they go. So I guess we can talk about the intranet and how the intranet is involved in this system as well because that's how you deliver a way to get there. So, um, you know, you can choose multiple tags, all sorts of things and all these metadata is all lookup SharePoint systems. Um, there's a reason for that because I use admin, user department to understand the approval system. So there's a bunch of approvers linked to the department of admin. So there's an actual another table that has the department of admin and all the users attached to that department. So there's a, bu a bunch of lookup tables. There's a document type lookup table because a document type has a friendly name, but also an acronym like policies has P, procedures has P-O-R or something like that. So there's additional stuff to this, but at a very front end, what you see here is you just select your options and your way you go. You know, if you don't want to publish as a PDF, you can untick it. It just publishes it as a Word document at the end of the day. If you want to add a security on there, whoever gets put here, the end product, only those people get to see it. And you can use security groups as well. The review period, you know, every 12 months, if you want someone to be notified, normally it's the document owner, they'll get notified through Teams. Every 12 months, that document owner will be pinged that the file is now up for review. So there's a, like, this is what all the client wants. We want something as we need to tell people something, or now I need to make something to let them you know, execute something for that. So that's where that came from as well. And additional provers, that's just a, once approval is made, it will just go to that next person they choose. So that is a, a dynamic option they can choose from going there. And then they just hit save. And once they hit save, all the requirement fields are met. You know, it updates the way it needs. It moves down because it's sorted. So it goes down to where it's spotted. And now there's changes found. So, with changes found, that means they can approve, submit for approval. If there's no changes found, you don't submit something that hasn't got any changes. So that's the way I kind of visualize this one column kind of rules it all of, you know, educating the user on what that file state is in and what they can do. So now I can just put my comments to the approval and then away it goes visual there and now it's checked itself out it's put it in there so they can cancel it it's putting in what who's it waiting for if there was multiple people a part of the department approvers multiple people's names will be there but only my name's there <laughs> for testing purposes and you know they can then cancel it so um, they can bring it back to the version it was uh, which i can quickly just do now um, it will just pop out a an attach flow because the state has changed. So the button action has changed. I can confirm the cancel, put it in there, run it, and then it will go through its system. Now the downfalls of SharePoint <laughs> is it's asynchronous. So it will not update like that has actually been done. So there are a little bit of downfalls to using SharePoint in this fashion. If I hit F5 and everybody remembers that name, you know, it's yeah. done. So it's asynchronous. It's a bit, it's a bit, you know, there are some shortcomings <laughs> with this stuff. But um, as long as the uh, the uh, client is educated in, in that space as well, then happy days. 
and then we just rinse and repeat. You know, it's been cancelled, and we can do our adjustments. You know, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to put that on there. Save it. That's done, and now we can hit submit. So there's there's slight improvements you can do. Like you can actually save this document without closing this app, but the client wanted the app to close to signify something has changed. <laughs> I would have actually just put the save button in the app, so then you can just approve it after, or just save and approve as well. But the client wanted this way, so <laughs> um, you know you might be like, I can see slight improvements. Like this is all being built on a client requirement and and stuff like that. So um, there are some shortcomings there as well the way it goes and um now we have to wait for the approval to be made I can tell when connor's got something in his brain i've been writing <laughs> down little pointers i want to ask but connor you go. <laughs> no it's just uh just curious so i mean i mean sharepoint isn't my uh isn't my forte um but uh obviously i can see obviously you had a bunch of lookup columns as you mentioned um i think there's four different drop downs so i'm, I'm assuming that those are just choice columns within your your SharePoint document library that you've got here, right? Yeah, so uh, they're actually just lookup columns, which in look a sense columns. is okay. a choice column. Um, <clears throat> uh, so if I hit edit here, it's just look up. It's just pointing to another list within this SharePoint site. And that list has additional things that I can pull from to execute the approval system a little bit better. Like I could put it all in this list, but you're, you're delivering too much information for the user when you can just go, give me the admin, and then you can then go department and, and approvers, which is like the properties of this system. You pop that out, and this is admin, prefix of A, and the approver is there. So when they submit an approval for admin, it will grab all those approvers and send it off. Now, the great thing about this system is if you are an approver and you are submitting approval, as you saw, it auto-approved. So it went through, it detected I'm the approver and it just auto approved itself. But um, it's a nice thing of just click on admin and then they get all the information about what is coming from admin. Go back, click on procedures, what is procedures? And you got the prefix of procedures. And then they can make their own prefixes. If they delete a prefix, it deletes, uh, if they delete a, a lookup, option here, it deletes from here. So the next time they hit properties, they would have to submit and it will come. Oh, I can just show you, I guess. <laughs> like uh, if I delete procedures, yeah. Properties, document type, procedures. I'll delete that, come back here. Get this refresh because asynchronous. Procedures is all gone. These are now broken, no procedures. But if I hit properties, I can't submit it. So that's what that lookup is. It now freely updates everything and tells them that there's something wrong with this file and it needs to be resubmitted because someone deleted procedures. <laughs> so Again, procedures I mean, obviously, like my, my, my SharePoint experience is, uh, is probably way, way below the average kind of Microsoft techie person. Um, yep. But I mean, I, I mean, I've seen that there's, there's things like SharePoint term stores and stuff for, for tagging and yeah. taxonomy. And I noticed that you had like tagging against some of these documents um, as well, which obviously under your tags, is there is there a benefit to to the way that it's currently built? So taxonomy, there's some limitations there. I actually started with taxonomy. Um, it is such a backend system still that it's very tedious to use by an end user. Um, okay. As well as pulling information from a taxonomy, you can't pull all the information of taxonomy. So if I wanted to make a document type called um, procedures, I could not put a prefix in taxonomy as an additional attribute because I can't read that from Power Auto uh, not even Power Automate, because when you call information of a taxonomy or a enterprise managed column, you don't get all the information from taxonomy. I don't know why, you just don't. So I just didn't want to put that limitation on me and I didn't want them to go to the taxonomy space and work a completely new system when they're already here and they click on this, very friendly. You know, click new, it's so easy. And so I suppose you get more 
like customizability using this 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 option yeah it's, like, it's I, I still see taxonomy as a the, they, they did convert it from classic to modern but it still seems a bit classic and back end like an admin process like you even have to put security on it and all sorts of stuff so, uh, and it's and it's them leaving the space and i wanted to keep this all within the control document management site um like term store i even have it here if i go here it's all once it loads uh CDMS departments audits like you can't pull additional attributes you know, only can pull the information from here as far as I'm aware if someone can come up and go yeah this is how you pull custom properties from a taxonomy through power to make cool <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure it out and by that stage I get to a certain point where I'm like trouble trouble and I'm like no nah, let's go back to SharePoint it's such an easy process and it's visually you can just click on the object and it will take you to whatever you need. So away they go, they can do a quick edit. With taxonomy, it takes a little bit longer to get through mm. that. So, and yeah, I've gone through a lot of iterations for a, a lot of systems just to come to this kind of end. There's product. a lot to be said for that continuity that you've created and that simplicity of, probably simplicity of licensing, simplicity of skills to a degree. There's a lot to be said, I'm guessing, for clients adopting this tool because you'd learn one set of skills with SharePoint lists and document libraries, and it's probably enough to operate and to use and to understand. Yeah, and then and the the technically using the SharePoint here, <clears throat> so why don't just keep them in there and keep them familiarized with this system? Yeah. Yeah. I noticed one uh, feature of this list there. You've got. Um, what looks like check in check out you've you've managed the problem of people going into your life cycle and then going back and editing documents how's that working yeah so if people are not aware um if you have a file open you cannot edit its metadata it will it will say i forget the term but lock for sharing i think is the terminology for that um and that was the biggest headache of them all it was you you have to stop users from being able to edit a file while they're submitting the file and it's just like you're working against the user just trying to stop them from doing something they shouldn't and it's a very hard thing to do <laughs> and when you give this product out to them they find all the problems because they do some weird stuff with your with your products that you know because you're coming in from a technical point of view you know very streamlined and then they're like i why would i even click on that but they do that so um this came out very early on that opening up a file adding the metadata kind of bricks the file in a sense so for let me just demonstrate you now if i open this in app now i've got it open i'll put side by side um i have so many files which files are property template property template now, if I hit properties here, I've got this file open, so I should not be able to edit it. And it's locked. So I've detected that the file is open because I can then run something that says this is shared. And all that is is when you hit that button and the Power App opens, it runs a Power Automate and comes back with a, a output, very quick, short automation to detect if it's locked. And it is. It's locked by me. So I'm telling the end user that it is locked. And if I close this and they keep this open, then click check lock state and now it's unlocked. So it's very quick. Just uh, just on that. So when obviously that 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 flow gets run, uh, I'm assuming that you're you're waiting for a response back from that flow before this app gets loaded on the side here. You can because uh, see... I've had issues where Power Automate flows um, take incredibly long to run. Um, and obviously, if if that kind of conditional access hasn't been put in place, then you end up with flows that are, are running or in progress of being run whilst apps are allowing users to do other things and you end mm -hmm. up running into a whole bunch of problems. So I'm interested to see how, how what the process is behind that Power Automate flow and Power App to allow the users to yeah. be able to, to see that in real time. The, the key is making it very short. And Power App, <laughs> pushes instant, instant flow. 
uh, where you know sometimes you have that delay for SharePoint modified and it takes there's a round time. I think the actual modern version of Power Automate allows you to detect on how short that runtime is for detecting change. Um, but yeah, Power Automate is instant and it's literally, I don't know, four actions. So it just runs through it in, in less than a second. I was actually quite surprised how quick it is. As you just saw. It was quick. Um, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll redo that again. Run. Boom. It's literally running, pushing a Power Automate and coming back with a with the outcome. So um, if it's any slower, I don't know, too, too bad. <laughs> it's, it's like, I can't do, there's no other thing I can do but use that system. Um, and I guess I can lock, start with a gray screen until that check comes back. But I, I don't, as you can see. Yeah, it's quick enough to work, isn't it, for an end user? Yeah. So what's it actually checking there, Paul? Um, you say there's a Power Automate flow, it's an instant flow, it goes and checks a thing. What's that thing it's uh, interacting with? So this is the lovely backend that everybody's familiar with. Um, I just got to remember which one it was. Check log file status. There we are. Let's see how fast it actually run. <laughs> yes, yeah, milliseconds. That's, uh, wow. That's very quick. OK. Uh, yeah. Let's now. Everything I do, I try to do a chart flow. Um, now, whether the audience knows what a chart flow is, um, it is essentially that is. It. Oh, yeah. Well done. New pop up for Power Automate. <laughs> That's it. So there's actually three, and two of them are just the Power Automate, and that. If everybody wants to copy it, sure, go right ahead. But it is locked by user. It is literally a HTTP okay. check. And anytime you use API, it's faster than anything. API is the most fastest way to call things. Because um, you know, if you use any other thing, it will then call the API eventually. Um, but is this, um, this, just curious as well, is any of the, the stuff that you're doing here, is this any uh, any of it premium actions, premium license needed? So yeah, this? disclaimer, Every time I do a Power Automate app or Power Anything for a client, I tell them that it is premium. There is no reason to put yourself in a box and work around free. <laughs> it is a way to cause a headache, but um, if you get at least one license, you can send off a child flow to that license and it can run a premium action then send back the information. So it's always just a freedom to run premium. So yes, this CDMS is a premium app, um, but I will point out if we ever reach areas where premium is used, I'll point that out. And I can say now it's really just the metadata input because I'm writing to a file and anytime you write to a file and use like Adobe services to convert to PDF using a premium action. If I didn't have any of that, which is very important for this system, <laughs> it would be free. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think I can speak from my own experience as well that, yeah, having premium licensing to do certain things, just it does save a whole headache of problems trying to do things with perhaps the free tools that you have and that you're trying to mm. figure out crazy ways around things um, when when just spending that little kind of little bit of extra to uh, to get access to some of these premium connectors does especially a lot of the api stuff does does help yeah lot, so. yeah like like uh, most most people know that this action is free uh http for sharepoint is free um but yeah anything outside of that it starts to get into the premium space as well as like the time you put in to try and make it free has ate into the cost the budget of it <laughs> and you're going to just write a premium action and get it solved so um, i do come from a project management side of things and being cost effective <laughs> as well uh, when delivering projects. But what you see here is on the Power Automate side, I just submit a thing. I send the, the selected file ID. It comes down here. I use a selected file ID for it to check. Then it comes back with, is it locked by? And if this is blank, it's not locked. If it comes back locked, I use that output as the friendly message in control document management. So I'm double handling the output of that file coming from the nice. HTTP call. So, we um we explored this idea a little bit with uh, 
I forget which one it was now, Connor, one of our Power Automate challenges where we're going to off, we use AI to craft friendly responses to, da- to data you give it. And, and we've taken the same opinion that there's certain use cases where as a business or an end user, you want that responsiveness. And if you're, you know, if you're prepared to think about the cost of it not being responsive, not getting used, all your development effort being wasted, mm. and you're thinking, I'm thinking a document management system here, which is quite comprehensive, and then you offset that against the cost of the premium license for this purpose, which is what, seven fourteen dollars something like that per month. I can't, I can't remember the per user license. You start to see the maths add up a little bit, don't you? It starts to make sense, like you've just said. Once you have one license, this is just talking yeah. about one app, one automate. You know that it just opens up for other things that, you know, uh, there are improvements, always improvements. That's one bane of developing stuff. You know, you, there's no stop to development. You always see little yeah. things you can change and stuff like that. But sometimes you're like, all right, I'm done. The client's happy. Stop touching. <laughs> yeah, it's so very easy sounds... to, to overdevelop, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, so easy. <laughs> Um, I'll just observe in another thing which catches my eye is your use of power apps in this context. I mean, I know it's power apps because we've chatted before and I know why you've made those choices and well, to a degree, sort of how you've how you've pieced your architecture together, which is fascinating. But what, we just dig into that a little bit. What are we looking at there? Yeah, so uh, the the system to enforce users to do a certain thing you have to use power apps it's the way to go so um, you can do a full canvas app and put that in front of it and display it through this way but this is what the client want they wanted the freedom of seeing the files and stuff like that and they're used to the library so just kicking out an app with ease and just delivering it this way was the one of the client and um, very minimalistic like there is 30 columns but what you see here is like the only columns they need to edit, which is not many. Um, and the way I manage this app, which I've not seen anybody else do, and I think I showed you, John, when we we're doing this, was um, you can't export this stuff. You can't, unfortunately, back in the day you could, but they actually stopped that. Um, the way I manage this is I don't edit this app through, okay, I have to, but um, if I go customize form, it will load the inbuilt power app to just that SharePoint list and it and it lives somewhere. I don't know where it lives technically. It lives in a system database that we have no access to, but it's part of the tenant. Um, and that's why you can't really export it. Now, the way I edit this, I don't edit it here. I actually edit it, let me just open it up, as a Canvas app for the exact same dimensions the exact same stuff. Anytime I need to do changes, I go to this Canvas app, modify the changes, and I literally just go copy paste. Now I can export this, and when I need to go to another client, it is literally create a new form, copy paste. Very easy. So I'll just over, I think I've opened another menu. So this is the exact same Canvas app, and if I need to change these words to something, like stated, whatever, um, I literally just copy form, copy, go here, delete this whole form. Let me just override. Okay, literally just copy paste into the form builder that's attached to SharePoint and wherever that invisibly stores it, you're just popping it in. Yep. And people are like, well, how about the variables and all that stuff and whatnot? Well, if you scroll up, here's the submit ID, here's that on edit, here's that on save. So these are all the on edits. This is the on save. Oh, that's right, on edit. And this is the submit ID. So this is the action of when you click on the SharePoint list, <laughs> on the SharePoint item. So I'll put the item ID, and when I click this, it's like clicking the properties button back on the CDMS. And then I'm interested to to see how it. your I noticed on your on your form when you when you brought it up on the right, it was showing the document that was clicked. I was just wondering mm-hmm. if you could show us the. I'm very interested to see how your pulling that information so you know exactly what item was being clicked in the document library. So when it does appear on the right inside of this app. uh, Sorry, let me just make sure. I'm getting out of control with these tabs. Uh, (laughs) This is causing you to shake, isn't it, Connor? You don't like it. Yeah, that's that's, that's the one. So yeah, I saw that and (laughs) I was like, well, how how are you bringing that back from 
from the item that was clicked inside of SharePoint. Well, obviously, there's a communication between PowerApps and SharePoint here, isn't there? Yeah. So, um, are you across the um, system of a integrated PowerApp with custom forms? When uh, it's not been something I've uh, I, I've actually looked too much into. I've only ever really built kind of oh, yeah, the from the ground side up. Of things, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, with this integrated form here comes the SharePoint integration system. So there's actually inbuilt SharePoint integration in Power Apps, and that's why it's a hidden app in the background. So if I go here, you got the SharePoint integration feature here. So this is what links everything together. And if you look into the source, this is the library. And uh, sorry. And on edit, on cancel, on new, on save, and all this stuff is all to do with the SharePoint system. So oh, yeah. when I hit properties, save, cancel, me clicking it to open it is on view. On view. So all these things are all linked in with the SharePoint system and this, that Power App integration tool. So as soon as you create a SharePoint list or a document library list uh, and you click on integration here, here, it will set up and marry the Power App with this SharePoint list. And now anytime you click here and this default thing that everybody's used to, it will load the Power App instead. It won't load the form editor, it will load the Power App integration with that system. That's all inbuilt into SharePoint. I didn't do anything. I just went so, in. And... So I have a, another question. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if you've had much experience with this side of things. So let's say, for example, I already had um, an app with a form on it and I'd built this separate to using that, uh, that integrate feature. Mm -hmm. um, and then I decided, oh, actually, this this form that I've got on this, on this app that I can be on mobile, in web browser, wherever it may be, I'd go right. I catch. I, I kind of like the idea of using this inside of this this list in this way. Is there a way yep. to integrate to SharePoint using that SharePoint integration without using the integrate feature? So you've already got a Canvas app. You want to go and link it up to uh, up to up to one of these document libraries. I know this is a little bit tangent. This is just a freeform Canvas app, and I've just made the this part here fit perfectly inside this here. And that's it. So you can actually make a Canvas app, whatever. But the takeaway is that SharePoint integration item here. So anytime you're pulling that dynamic ID of the file you clicked, it's inbuilt coming from the SharePoint integration here. So if I want the ID of the title, so let's take a look at the title, wherever I bloody put it, <laughs> file name. Uh, see how it's got SharePoint integration that's selected. So this yep. is a, a table or record of some sort. It's going selected. It's got all the information of the file that I've selected from that, uh, that link in between that SharePoint list. And now I'm just pulling the full file name with extension. So this could be dynamic to any list, essentially, because um, that SharePoint yeah, integration yeah, absolutely. would just be yeah, pointing so to I, wherever that app is placed. If I brought this out and pasted it into another SharePoint list, this is so generic. This is will just pull the, whatever the other name I clicked on from the other list. It's all, all generic. The, the trouble is um, exporting this and saving it and bringing it over to another client. You can't do that. So this is where this comes in. And if I look at the exact same button I looked over here, so check lock. No, what was it? It was file name here. If I go to file name here, it's the exact same thing. But this something I've made and I'm pulling information into this as a record. So when I copy paste it over, it's just it's just cosmetic names. It will just take on what was in the SharePoint integration. So this is actually just a, a record I've created through submitting this. I know it's a little bit complicated. So if I select here, it's just literally building it, sure. building it, and then packing it into this SharePoint. So I literally made an exact copy of the yeah, SharePoint the integration stop. table so I can test it because you can't test stuff in here because I'm not selecting anything. You can yeah. kind of trick it a little bit by saying, oh, no, I have actually selected an item and, and you filter the data source to be that exact item and you have to, then you forget you've done it and you published it and now it's just not showing other items because you forgot to take it off. Uh, no, you just pump in a, an ID, so 110. 
do I submit? But it'll and it'll behave the same way. And then, and then I need to say, what am I doing? So I've loaded the item, I've selected it, but now what am I doing? I'm now going to edit. It. Now it's literally so active. You're as. essentially you just simulated the testing process. Absolutely. Mm. And now I can nice. test it freely, do whatever I want to do, visualize it all. Once I'm happy with it, I literally just copy paste it. Boom, boom. That's nice. I like, I like that. Now, I don't know the how beauty. I figured that out. I just was like, well, everything's packed into this one thing. Why don't I just make that one thing myself? So clever. <laughs> yeah. What I love about uh, this is, um, I mean, this is a bit of a passion project of my own at the moment. I'm exploring solutions and exploring life cycles and stuff. And what you've done there, by doing it in that way, you're able to package up your the app that's going to go to the client because you can't package up a SharePoint list in a solution, no. can you? So you've no. you've packaged up the app and then you just reproduce that process of copy paste into their list when you import the solution. Love that. I yeah. think it's really clever. Yeah, and I can I can easily create a new list. Document library can be like that. That app is from a document library, but I can create a list as well. But I'll just do it with a document library. Brand new document library, yeah, whatever. Uh, create. I'll show you how. Got your is. your naming conventions and test names <laughs> are better than ours. <laughs> Anytime I find As a weird name like that, two. it's it's freely deletable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now now this, if so I you know create, create menu, new, yeah. um, like this, and now if I hit this and edit all, you're just going to get that default metadata thing. Everybody's used to it. Great. So if I do integration instead, then do a custom form. Now it's told the SharePoint list to when I hit edit, load the Power App instead. And this is the Power App that's linked with that SharePoint item. Uh, you're going to be given the default uh, form layout, but then you just go delete. So this is the default form layout. And once I hit publish, You know. And again, this is where you could just copy and paste over from your your kind of testing bench, if you correct, like. Correct, correct. Yeah. So if I go back to the library, I love how it doesn't open in tab. But now there we go. We're just going to give that a refresh. It's not quick. So there we go. Now loading the app instead. So that is that SharePoint integration. Now I've got one thing I can then submit. But now I can just go delete this whole thing. Go to my Canvas app, copy this whole thing. That's golden. That's a really quick way to port your user interface. Obviously, errors That's, aside. Because there's no metadata linked with this no. stuff. Um, no. But essentially, no. I can publish it. <laughs> mm. um, but it's still going to come up with document.docx because this is a, just a generic one that the title exists, the file name exists. But yeah, now it's published. So five on that. I mean, as, a, as somebody who, uh, yeah, still, still somebody who thinks about design a lot in the way things are kind of presented to, to users and stuff, I mean, is there any kind of concerns, considerations we should think about in terms of things like dimensions for this form? Um, does, does responsiveness work in that little panel that pops out if it's built correctly in the, in the app as well? So can you build responsive designs? Yeah, so there's a, there's a reason why it's sitting right in the middle of this uh, I guess this is actual mobile layout that I've chosen. Yeah. For some reason, um, this, what do you call it? Uh, resolution scale, uh, canvas scale, um, is not the same scale as a SharePoint pop out. This is the scale. And the way I figure out scale is I literally just go um, rectangle. Look over there, there's my scale. <laughs> Now I go here and I, well, literally I can copy paste over, but I will then make a perfect scale, make it in a container, and then I can't actually fall out of that container. And now everything's just forced in that scale forever. And I can't make a mistake because it's inside of a nice canvas hat. That's how I maintain the fixed space uh, in that. Because if I did go over, if I paste it in here, it would just bug out and come pop them back in because you can't go outside of this square because it's literally hard set. 
So that's how I, I maintain it. I use a uh, container with a perfect it's gonna exact be, size. Uh, it's going to be a challenge I'm going to set myself is uh, having to go build in a, a custom form inside a SharePoint. So I've never done yeah, before, but I see it done all it. the time. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's there's it's there's that fun. argument of don't use a form, use fields and patching instead. Um, I use forms for this type of stuff because it's simplistic. Like I don't I don't need a fancy patching system or anything like that. I don't need this to be. It's all linked with the SharePoint form that was created when I first in its first inception. It's just it's easier because it already sets up the updating and everything like that. Um, once you start getting real big with a lot of information and several um, screens, yeah, I, I like patching a little bit better. And the difference between patching uh, and the SharePoint integration is all done through that on save. You use the on save for just the normal integration. Um, with the patching, you would use another button that updates it in the back end. I won't get into it, but <laughs> um, I like I like to use forms just for simplistic stuff like this because it's uh, easier to. No, I think uh, it depends on the the complexity of the yeah. Uh, yeah. of the things you submit as well, doesn't it? Yeah, and then you know if you're pulling from other tables, all sorts of stuff, you kind of you you want to leave this stuff behind because it's becoming too complex for a form to manage other data sets coming from other places. Um, and you kind of put yourself in a box and you're stuck in this little form thing in a sense. It's a really neat tip that actually just to constrain yourself by design almost with that container. Yeah, containers um, um, are a big thing I find. And you can do uh, shadowing, <laughs> big win. Um, so Paul, you, you've shown us, um, I, I imagine there is a huge amount more to see in the back end and the way you've designed that kind of that management aspect of CDMS. But we, we've got 10 minutes or so left. Um, could we have a look at the sort of the end user aspect, what this thing might manifest, how it might feel to an end user who's who's getting a document coming through this process? What's that aspect of it looking like? Yeah, so on the uh, on the left hand screen, um is one just standard user and on the right is another standard user so i guess i'll start with uh the left hand side is this is from just a normal point of view from uh, a staff member in the cdms and what they will do is they would submit something so what i will do now is the hsec is actually managed by mike smith so when i hit a property uh, okay, I haven't run this for a while for this user, so you just have to allow <laughs> the SharePoint um, service. And there we go. I just need to update this, hit save, and we'll do it again. We'll do it on this one. We'll hit submit, target in, away it goes. So what this will now do is it will send it off to Mike Smith, and we will jump to Mike Smith now. It's telling me it's waiting. to Mike Smith. Everything is done through Teams approvals. Um, it does take a little bit. It is Power Automate, and this system is built for um, not instant submission, not instant approval. This is something that takes maybe a few weeks to approve. It is something that is checked every once a year kind of thing. It is policies, and now it's come through. So what I have done is it's coming from my name, but my name is the automation account. It should actually come from an automation account. So that's why you see that. But this is the end product of the approval system. It's come to Mike Smith. It's been submitted. This is just all cosmetic stuff. It's giving me the output that it's going to be. And I can now read it. So I'll click on this file. It's taking me there. It's put me into read only. If I want to hit edit, I can't because the file is locked during the process of approval. You shouldn't be able to edit something if it's out for approval. Right? So that's great. Now I can close that down. It looks good. Okay, I'm going to hit approve. Now that's sending it off. It's telling the other user that their system has been approved. I'll just pop out Teams. It's got a full communication system behind it just to keep the user informed. Um, and then it publishes it based on what the metadata was chosen. Oh, new teams, right? 
And when we go back here, even me being a control docu uh, controller, the document controller, I only have read-only access to the published space. This is where all the documents end up in their final form. Uh, if I've chosen publish as PDF, it converts the Word document to a PDF. But what we saw, if I jump back here, um, I even forget which one I did. I think it was the incident report part one. It's approved. If you scroll over, it will tell you all the information about the approval process, all the metadata is in there, when it was approved, the person that approved it, there's great, you know, there's my comments. Is it up for review, 18 month review, stuff like that. So if I click on this again and open it up in, you will see these squiggly marks at the top. Let me just scroll in. This is JSON. Now I read this file, I see these JSON and I replace it with the metadata. So I'll go to the incident report part one in the publish space. Incident report part one. If I open that file, there it is. So this is what the published version is. So the staff member that works in the controlled space will understand the options they can put around the file. And this is the end product. It was a form, it was ID of 78 and it's version one, published prefix, ID, published version. And that's, that's ultimately what they want. So if I can go back, I can then go properties, I can change it to publish PDF, I can hit save, rinse and repeat. It will then deliver it as a PDF instead. Submit, goes off to Mike, Mike approves. Everybody knows approvals. <laughs> and that is the turnaround time. It's actually quite quick, but this system shouldn't technically be quick. It is now converted to yes. This is a system that may take days or weeks for an approval to happen. And if we go here, it should remove this word document because this should not have version control in it. This is just the end product or the version history and everything's back in the control document space. So it's nice and clean. Um, I actually delete the file to get rid of it. And now it's a PDF. So if I open that, now this is a cool little thing. If you click on a PDF, it, lo it replaces this web page and it will load the PDF. So the client wants it to be able to open in that in the tab. So <laughs> there we go. There's the exact same file. I think I just want to quickly just uh, plug some obviously we spoke about uh, a couple of weeks ago for anyone that did attend that session who's watching. Um, it's just, again, it's another good reason why understanding JSON and learning about JSON and how you can use it inside of uh, inside and sort of many things. Um, again, just uh, Paul's just showed a great use case for it here. But again, if you want to watch that session, I'll uh, I'll post a link in uh, in the chat room. Um, yeah, it's fascinating that, isn't it? Kind of taking that metadata and, and transposing it on the finished document. And that's that's the flow there that you alluded to earlier, Paul, that is using the premium connector to convert to PDF. It's, I assume there's an action to do something with the, the document. Yeah, various actions that can write Word reading JSON. Uh, yeah. And I'm just using okay. Adobe because I wanted to convert it to a PDF as well. So Adobe actually yeah. comes with a free uh, 500 call a month action. But to okay. use that action, you need a premium license to call any third party um, actions anyway. So, um, but yeah, Adobe PDF services, I think it's called. Um, yeah, look into it. It's, it's a great little thing for free. Yeah, that's not bad, is it? I mean, if it's this kind of thing, I mean, yeah, depending on your volume of documents, but 500 a month seems seems more than adequate this is for, for a lot the of control use document cases. space. Yeah, so policies yeah. and stuff. Like they're not working with hundreds and hundreds. Like I no. would work for a company that had hundreds of policies. But uh, <laughs> that would be your just, full time just, job, right? <laughs> just a quick view. <laughs> this is the back end of it, and that's it. Uh, I, there's more uh, JSON that they can use. Uh, this is a list I give them. They can put a title, they can put an ID, a department, the document owner, the approval dates if they want. Um, and then I just call the file, replace all the JSONs, and away they go. Yeah. And you could provide to them as much custom JSON information as they wanted. Yeah, give me more squiggly, squiggly stuff they want to put in there. Uh, it all comes off their metadata. Um, yeah, it's world's their oyster when it's just text replacement. <laughs> At the end of the day, with Jason, we've only touched the tiniest bit of this solution, we and I've recognised that. We haven't looked at the automation at all. Like, <laughs> we haven't automate side, um, which comes with uh, child flows and 
calling from power ups into automate and all that stuff so but as you can see this is the back end these are all the assets used for this system so 37 all up uh 12 flows i think one's uh deprecated right now and like using environmental variables this is huge this is a way to say this is my sharepoint site at this level so you don't have to change anything in the power automate it's you changing it once here and it changes every single document library where that exists. This is the most powerful thing to do when delivering the exact same product to many clients down the track. Um, environmental variables. It's yeah, awesome. that's something I'm going to need to dig into because we were looking at solutions and pipelines and um, using uh, connection references, which is p part of a story of portability. But someone in that chat actually referenced uh, environment variables, and therefore that feels to me like a very fundamental thing to portability and to moving your your yeah. products. Because just you simply putting, uh, where are we? Um, oh, so it's the same as a connection reference. In as such, a connection reference is an alias to a connection. This is a, an alias to a, a location no, on location your environment. Correct. So okay. if you put if you put default list value in there and you export this and import it, it will come up requesting for that item. So you can't yep. actually deliver this product into a client without first creating that SharePoint list to support your app. Mm -hmm. So you would build it all. You can call the list something completely different, not advisable, <laughs> but you then yeah, just load it in there and it just connects it all up and away you go. You can't do this in Power Apps. Just FYI, can't do it in Power Apps. Everybody has to have a Power App license to be able to call an environmental variable inside of it. This is only for Power Automate. Yeah, okay. it's a little bit backwards there. But. Pretty much everything you can see, you've got 12 cloud flows we've not even dug into yet, but um, pretty much everything you're sharing with us is encapsulated in a solution, I presume. This whole thing is exportable except the SharePoint lists, but I also export them as template lists and import them in as templates. Okay. I yeah. So you import this. metadata columns <laughs> manually uh, ever again. Uh, or make door yeah. So you, or okay. So you create a skeleton list effectively, and that's your portable thing along with your solution. That's fantastic. Uh, list settings, and you have to do some Power Automate, a uh, Power Shell stuff, and there's your document library template with all the metadata. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I say, I, th yeah. I think this is definitely worthy of, uh, of more time spent looking into this because, the, like I said, I mean, uh, my jaw my, my dropped, Connor, just, when we, sorry, that's the thing, my, my mind was blown away by obviously all the, the stuff that you've done with power ups inside of the SharePoint side. Um, and obviously there's a whole host of things that are sitting behind the scenes, which, uh, like John Smith, we haven't even dug into yet which look interesting. So one thing I did forget to bring up was uh, how the end user just travels to the published space. So they're not gonna just go to the published space and see a hundred files. They're actually gonna be delivered a, a view to the files they want. So that would be done through the intranet. I build intranets as a very minimalistic way, just some squares that take you to the next place. But here is like the control document, just some short examples. So if I click on incidences, it's going to load the incidents tag. So every file that has the incidences on them. And there we go. There's just the all well, the incidences. If I go back to the intranet again, I do HR. Hopefully I've set this up right. There's only one file that has been supplied by the human resource department. So that's how. So is that just a view that it's launching there? It's a SharePoint. Um... Yeah, if, you, if you look closely, it's just got <coughs> filter right here. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, and filter. if you read up here, it's got department filter value human space resources and that's that's really it and that's and you would have way more squares because you have way more um tags and way more departments and stuff but you reduce the squares to make it a little, little bit easier to see um but if you do go back to there there's all the views that you've built so oh, i want to look at all the purchasing now there are not so um but all of these actually came from the client <laughs> i didn't make these up so um I want to just, uh, just uh yeah just a question on this side of things i mean obviously you, you send them to, to independent views and things like that so it's, i'm assuming that there is a bunch of security as well that's been set up behind the scenes so only certain people can access maybe certain views um 
on certain items. So no wall views is just a sorting feature. If there's security on a file, that file doesn't exist to that person if they don't have access to it. So if they click on a view, it's not going to supersede a security, uh, something set by security. So we just deliver all views, and if they don't have access to the file, then it's an empty list, pretty much. Um, but yeah, that, that just harps back to the app itself. You can actually set the security, and it actually changes the security on the file itself. So it literally oh, removes the every one group. By default, everybody gets access. It removes that, and then just adds the people that you've chosen. And now that is a custom secured file within a everybody space just by them selecting that in the app so that's another feature of the of the system is security based management so nice. more stuff fantastic um i mean there's a really nice use you just showed there we only sort of skimmed on it but a um, really great way of exposing the right the right information to your teams and your organization through a company intranet using those buttons and just such a simple way of doing it just mm. presenting those buttons to them, which creates the filter, which which gives them the documents they need really easily. A great yeah, use I, of company internet I, there. I like to call it when I explain it to clients is the crossroads to their business. It is a place where you go just to move on to the next spot. It doesn't hold data. It just holds a link to where they need to go. And that's how I, I go by doing that. <laughs> Make it simple. <laughs>